In this lecture, uh, we will discuss how we form, how we acquire political ideas and opinions, what, what, what about these political ideas and opinions, how they're transmitted, uh, also a little bit about public opinion in general and how it is measured, and then about what are parties and <clears throat> what is the role of political parties. So political socialization, what is political socialization? Political socialization is the process through which individuals, you and me, uh, learn the political norms, values, and institutions of the society of which they are a part. This is the process to which we, under, we start to have ideas and acquire ideas about politics. What you're doing now, by the way, right? Uh, but outside of the formalized way of being taught about this, of, of, of learning about this, how do you acquire? How do you acquire political ideas, notions about what politics is, what politics is supposed to do? Remember our question, what is politics? Um, and the opinions and values about politics, the opinions, beliefs and values about politics in a society constitute that society's what? Political culture. So political culture is basically the culture of a society related to it in relation to so what are the ideas, opinions, values, beliefs that characterize the society regarding politics? Or I, can, uh, I could uh, rephrase it as, what are the expectations um, about politics and what politics is and what politics should do in a society? For example, um, we have a well-defined view of what the government is supposed to do, even if it varies a little bit, but it varies within a very sort of a narrow range because we are, for us you know the idea that oh there's a free market or, or there's the state well in many other countries there is no such conflict because one is it's not one or the other and this is just an example and it's not about right or wrong this is not the issue at all here in this class the point is to understand that certain assumptions about what is government what is supposed to do is government something bad, some, something good, that's just broadly speaking, right? But there are very many details about what politics is, and what is my role in politics, and what is, what is, the, what is the right way to go about, and just political ideas about how we should organize ourselves, how we should live together. This differs from country to country. And the Constitution, as I mentioned before, the US Constitution, is based on very specific political culture. And it has shaped the US political culture. Because it is the backbone of laws in, within which you are, you grow up and you, you assume it. And you say, well, this is normality. So political culture is basically, what is normality for a given society when thinking about politics? And trust me, that's, it differs. And you will say, well, mine is bad. Well, that's what the other guy says as well. Um, so the question is, how do you acquire these opinions and values? beliefs, right? What are the sources? Because we don't, we call each other individuals nowadays, the individual is a recent term which has been, was invented about a couple of centuries ago only, it didn't exist before, because before it was called person, right? Individual means that has this sound, right? Individualism that we are alone, that there is an I that is separated from the world, but that's obviously false, right? Because we are born from, from other human beings biologically, we cannot be separated, we are connected biologically, socially, and everything we know, everything we are. I gave the example before of the children who are raised by wolves or, you know, Mowgli in the uh, jungle book and so on, but there are many cases that happen like that, but they never become human beings, because without, everything we are is acquired. Even if there is a basis that makes that acquiring possible, natural basis, biological basis, we are able to learn, but in order to become fully human beings, as in Aristotle, remember, fully human beings you need the city, you need society. So everything we are, including political ideas, is are acquired and then processed. Then they are processed, we're not just simple box of matter, I would say. So what are these sources through which these, these, these views, which are, you know, Rarely conscious, it's really that you know you're being sat down and told, well, this is how it is, right? In in in, in just life, uh, in your family and whatever, you acquire these simply through living. Even if you never think about politics, information is acquired. So, what are some of these sources that you all know? Where where have you acquired your first ideas, first knowledge about politics? Well, 
I'm sure that many of you will say family. Right? So when you talk about sources of political socialization, so sources through which you become a member of the society, sources through which you become a member of this political culture, the first and foremost, obviously, is society. Uh, I'm sorry, is family, right? Uh, you're not raised by the society. Uh, so the family is the first thing, and it can be direct by being told about, you know, well, well, this is how we live, this is the president and whatever, or it can be part of the way you live, simply the way you live, so certain things of certain behaviors are acquired, certain the respect for the, for the freedom of the other, or not the respect, or an authoritarian view, right, or just the way in which, so that's an, a way of life in the family to which the child actually learns most, uh, most things. Or it can be another way of indirect learning, to, for example, the functioning of this family. The family is a small society, although it's, it's a different sort of a society. It's a biologically you know, connected one. Um, so, but the relationships in the family can also teach you things about authority, or freedom, or limits, or law, or rules, right? Uh, which, which will shape how you view the world, and that will shape how you view politics. Is that this, you know, again, philosophy is not something remote, it is basically your ideas about the world. That's philosophy, right? Only that more rationally developed, more well-examined uh, sets of such ideas are actual philosophy, uh, like Plato's and so on, and you, in many cases it's just, we pick uh, pieces from as we go on. Um, but it is your idea about the world that shapes how what you think about politics. So what's another source? School, of course. Right? There's a next step, right? You go to what, kindergarten, then uh, primary school, whatever. Uh, here's again where you will acquire ideas, beliefs, opinions, consciously, directly, or indirectly, unconsciously. Consciously or directly, you are taught. You take civics course in high school or whatever. Right? You take this course in college, so you, you, you learn certain things, knowledge, acquire knowledge, so training. But remember that training, you know, it's a training itself, as you notice I'm trying to, my approach to political science, to teaching this course in political science, and in general political science is very, uh, you know, politically neutral, because I don't care about different political parties <clears throat> in as much as I care about you understanding how things work, and then using whatever ideas you have to to, to enter into politics, right? To participate. Uh, but that's not always the case. In France, for example, uh, this was, as I mentioned, this was one of the main, one of the main tools of creating the French na nation, the French nationality, was, was the school system. Because it was run by the state in the 19th century, and this is where people were taught that there is a France, that here's the French history, and you're French. And people who didn't really speak French, actually, because uh, uh, <laughs> they came from various regions, were taught the official version of the language. You know, this is how the French nation was shaped by the state, by the state. And we talked about this. But so, textbooks that you get to, to study in school um, are another way of um, you know learning. So sometimes this learning can be directed in communism in totalitarian so societies. You will have specific teaching. You know, the leader is the best, and communism is the best, and whatever. Even here, right, you pledge allegiance to the flag, right? But that's, that's education. That tells you that this is, these are the values. So you are taught things. They are not indoctrinated, taught, right? You are taught because this is part of socialization. You are part of the society. But all other things that are indirect, unconscious, can also shape your view of politics. For example, the type of the methods of, teach, of teaching, of the relationship between teacher and student and pupil. In many Asian countries, I, we know that uh, there is a much more um, directive method of teaching in the sense of the students just sit in, the, sit in, the, uh, in, the, their, in their chairs and uh, there's this, they don't say anything basically. There's no communication. It's not a, it's not a communicate, communication based, but it's more like just telling them as it is, and so on. Um, so that, it is a reflection of relationships in society where authority, relationships, and so on, but it can also shape the relationships in the society. So that can be a reflection of society, but also creates 
uh, you know, members of the society that uh, work according to those norms, you know, figures of authority, authority that's very respected in Japan, right, you know, uh, all these things. Or another way to be schooled in politics, so to speak, is by uh, taking part in different uh, structures within the school that are political, so to speak. For example, you're part of the school uh, board or uh, college Republicans or college Democrats and whatever. So you start acquiring the skills of politics. And if you remember from all the president's men, well, where did many of these people whom Nixon hired, hired where do they, did they get their training, right? They got their training by doing the same uh, sabotage tactics in college when they were in the uh, college Republicans. School is another one, peers, so the age group, and this is mostly unconscious, but not necessary. So, for example, most people, few people are politically active or aware and actively seek out political information and, and document themselves. <clears throat> most people acquire uh, this information at second hand. So you have the, the opinion shapers, right, who are political agents in a way because or agents of political socialization because they transmit information and there are many other people who learn from them. So your book calls them, you know, one step and two step uh, removed from, you know, political information. But here is where peers group are important because you learn about things through I don't know, Facebook posts or talking with friends and, oh, well, yeah, really, that's, that's what happened and this is what meat means. So you hear these things and even if you don't care about politics, Especially if you don't care about politics, this is how you will get most of the information. The other thing, the other aspect of peer groups is, well, you want to be integrated. You know, it's the peer pressure, so to speak, right? Well, not necessarily pressure, but it's the, the fact that there are, this is how things are done. And each peer group, right, groups of friends, there are things that are done, things that are not done, this is what we can allow ourselves to do. So there's a way of life. And that way of life, just like in the family or, or elsewhere, shapes you tells you about what's right and wrong. And some instances, and your book gives some interesting uh, examples of political radicalization, terrorist groups, terrorist cells, so to speak, that are not really cells because they're not connected with anyone, but a bunch of guys, really a bunch of guys, hanging out and kind of radicalizing each other, talking uh, nonsense, but kind of that creates a thing, well, let's do this, let's do that, and so on. And that creates, that leads to some, uh, some, some, extreme acts. And, and, you know, this is documented. Then we have the broader culture, a culture that can be high and low, right? Meaning culture in the sense of whatever comes through all the means of communication, uh, entertainment, uh, movies. In movies, it's very, they're very clear messages of what's right, what's wrong, and so on, and what is politics, and this, and that, and what should be done, and so on. And most people just Again, acquire these things because, well, this is how it's done. This is how we live. It's sort of, this is normality. But remember that normality, not that there isn't a normality, but <laughs> this is not normal. This is how this specific society and actually specific media produces an image of normality. But you look at, you go to the movies and you say, well, I guess it's, this is how it's done. I guess you do that. I guess, well, I guess this is how you should behave, right? You don't even internalize this, but they become models. It's very important, and they shape your your imagination and your actions. High culture, also, you know, uh, real <laughs> real culture, uh, uh, you know, works of um, literature, art, and so on, to which you, uh, you know, which endure the test of time. Uh, but most that, you know, well, let's be honest, most people get the views of their views of society, their views of the world. If we talk about culture, about you know, low culture. But it's not only what comes, low culture doesn't mean only what comes from the media, it also means in the sense of civilization culture. So the way we live, right? The way we live. Are we more alienated from each other? As uh, Aristotle perhaps would point out, you live in some suburb, you don't know your neighbor, right? That's part of the civilization, uh, how you interact. Or are you more organically connected in other countries? In Italy, you know everyone, families always gather together, every day you go home for lunch. Uh, and it's a family lunch, and that's a big meal, and then you have a siesta and whatever. So, uh, society is much more intertwined. So that's also part of culture. But that tells you uh, that, that that gives you a different sort of uh, view of society. If you live in an alienated society, let's say, 
uh, then you will be more individualistic. You will, you know, there's no skin deep, I mean, there's no connection with the other that goes beyond the skin, so to speak, right? In a, in a more organically, more cooperative society, like, you know, give the example of the Italian one, you have a more communal sense of, well, we're all in this together and it's not so much individualistic, and there's ups and downs for it. every sort. But there are different cultures, but you see how they do shape policies, because when you take then a decision, it's about protecting the individual's freedom, or is it about protecting the common good? These are different things. Then, obviously, religion, because this is basic, right? This has to do with the notions of right and wrong. It has to do with what is, is, is right, what is meaningful, what is wrong, what is, what is uh, uh, not meaningful, right? Obviously, it will shape uh, your view of the world, and it shapes your, just like anything else. Uh, any, uh, it shapes then what you, the goals that you think we should pursue together, and so on. And there's no such thing as separation of religion and politics. It's like saying separation of, of, uh, uh, of all of the, any of these things from politics. Like separation of morals from politics, separation of philosophy from politics. That's, it's absurd. Right? Because it's basically what we're talking about is your view of the world as a person. Your inhabiting of the world. And most of these things are not conscious. But all of them shape what you think about politics in terms of values and norms, but also what you know about politics. So, uh, you, can, you can separate any of these from politics as much as you can separate yourself from politics. Identity. Um, well, I, I, I list identity here. Your book does not, but I want you to kind of consider it. Identity, uh, I, I kind of stray from the book, and this is why there's a lecture. Um, because identity uh, traits or aspects of identity, such as, such as uh, socioeconomic, um, ethnic, I mentioned uh, religion, but let's, let's put it here again, uh, gender. So aspects that define you as your identity, right? I'm a working class, uh, Polish, uh, Catholic woman. You know, in the 60s, right? That's a, that's a specific identity set, right? And all of these aspects do shape your political views. Because if you're from a lower, upper class, you more richer cl uh, class, you are, used, you are used to certain things being natural, you have different expectations from society, you're used to things getting your way, and so on. A more working class, maybe, or maybe a poor, people who are poor, they don't really participate in politics. Why do you think it is? Because they feel... Um, disenfranchised. They don't feel they have any, because they don't have a word to say in their life in a way, not in their life, but in, in society, being poor, they're marginalized, they obviously don't feel themselves that they can have any say in politics. That's, that's a major thing. Uh, ethnic, right? Ethnicity also, and, or race, can shape. Not only because you might have a history of, or you've been told that you have a history of persecution, or, or, you, or you've been a victim as a Jewish person, you might have been, you know, from grandparents who were in the suffered from the Holocaust and so on. So all these shape, shape you, shape you about, shape your view of the world, or you might be, uh, have lived in under a dictatorship or whatever, uh, or as an ethnic, you know, different ethnic groups have different traditions, and there's more hierarchical and more communal, again, the Italian Americans versus, you know, Scandinavian Americans, not the same country. Religion, obviously, we talked about this, but think of it also from the perspective of group, religion, right? So me as a part of a persecuted, say, minority, religious minority, I might feel, you know, I will develop a certain sensitivity to persecution, to freedom, and to protecting freedom, and so on. And gender, obviously, because gender roles will shape the way I see my place in the world, and then the way I see politics, obviously. And they're not always the same. So, family, school, birth, peers, all of these shape your Sources of socialize, social sources of political socialization, sources of, of that shape your or agents of political socialization rather these are agents uh, factors that shape your views of politics uh, because they shape your views of the world basically. Uh, another important agent of uh, political socialization, a key agent actually, which we kind of touched upon because these are not separate. You see, they they overlap, right? Uh, is the media. 
So the media basically, what is the media? The mass media are the vehicles through which information about the society uh, is, uh, is the vehicle through which information about the society is selected and transmitted back to the society. Media is a reflect information that it gathers from a society back to the society. But you see, this is not a unidimensional, it's not a simple process. So information is collected from here, sell, uh, filtered, and then transmitted back here. But this transmission back here has an effect then on the society, so this reality that will change. But here's the, here's the thing. There are so many, <laughs> there are so many issues here, right? And when I say media, I mean everything: traditional media, newspapers, TV, which can be news or entertainment, radio, you know, radio uh, news, C-SPAN, you listen to C-SPAN or NPR, and so on. Uh, but also new media, electronic media, blogs, websites, uh, and, and and so on, or social media, Facebook, Twitter, forums, and so on. All these are filters, but when we talk about media, we're talking about you know professional media uh, uh, that that has the role journalism, right? That has the role of delivering information, and you're reading all the president's men, and that's about the role of the media in a democracy. But here's the thing: um, here's the key thing. This is not a unidimensional uh, process because you notice this this process. So you're collecting information. Let's say this agent of the media, right? <clears throat> but which information are you collecting? Because the media reports, and most of what you know about the world comes from the, let's say, news sources. But think about the fact that in the US there has been a huge uh, uh, building down, I mean, a uh, huge um, undoing of the media and journalistic life, because today there are only a few major news agencies. So what this means, actually, it means that most of the, the information you know that world comes from very few sources. There are only a few world news agencies, Reuters and, and uh, Agence France Press and whatever. So what gets to you, actually, except for what your cousin writes about your, your aunt and so on, what gets to you as news, let's say it's international, it comes from a few sources. I mean, newspapers, let's say your, your uh, Seattle Times. I don't know exactly about Seattle Times, but let's say, Seattle Times. Do you think Seattle Times has its own guy in Taipei, or Hong Kong, or Tashkent, or Moscow? Maybe in Moscow, but maybe, you know, in Mongolia? So where do you, how do you get to know those things? Because there are these international news agencies that collect that information and then sell it. So these individual news outlets, even the big ones like Seattle Times, they buy that information. But it means that it comes from one source. Well, but each source each media agent, right? And this is the, the, the problem of agenda setting. The problem is that each individual media source selects which information it collects, then selects how it presents it. So what you see is a niche of reality, which you say, well, this is reality. No, no, this is what you have heard through this specific agent about reality, in a specific way. Because no information is simply delivered, although that's the ideal of journalism in a way, but especially in an era of partisanship as we have today in the United States, it is also interpreted. So not, not only do you get a part of information that it's interpreted, for, let, let's, let's make a simple comparison. Go on BBC uh, News, Go to BBC News. I think it's news.bbc.co.uk. But go to BBC News and go to the international section and read the news that are listed there. Go to Washington Post, go to the international section and read the news that are listed there. And you see that, the, or listen to BBC versus listening to whatever uh, news station uh, here. The problem is that there's very little international news that gets is reported here. Why BBC, which is an English channel, right, an English media agent, it has a much wider world uh, uh, opening. And actually, if you go in many countries, you see that there's much more international news that we get here. What we get is kind of a small news about something big, but, you know, there's a volcano erupting or some catastrophe. You know, usually it's extraordinary, right? But, as you see, and you're saying, well, this is reality. This is what really happens. No, it is how the media portrays it. Recently, another example, recently there was this 
<coughs> the enraged person who staged an attack on the parliament in Ottawa in Canada, right? A few days ago, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks, I think, right? And how different it was, because in the news media, in the US news media, it was the emphasis was terrorists, terrorists, and this is the 9 11 of Canada. Well, the Canadians who actually suffered the attack did not portray the events as such. If you went to the uh, Canadian uh, media pages and so on, it was, well, the range person, he has problems, uh, documented psychological problems and so on. And there was this case where this uh, American news lady went to the, these kind of members of the Canadian Parliament, I think, and she kept pushing them to, to talk about, oh, this terrorist, and they, no, no, they, no, no, it's a problem with a uh, person with psychological problems. No, no, but terrorists, no, 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 it's just, you know. And she was getting a frustrated because her interpretation did not match their interpretation. It's just an example, and I'm not saying one was right or the other one was wrong, because it turns out to have been, have psychological problems and, you know, an ideological motivation. So, you know, both can coexist, you know, easily. Uh, <clears throat> no one said that the terrorist is sane, or could be sane, right? Um, the point is that the agenda setting, meaning the selection of information about the world, is done by certain agents. And different sources will give you a different information. It doesn't mean that, oh, you're not seeing the truth or reality. No, but it's, it's a fact of life. If I ask, if you ask 10 people about the same event that they have witnessed, they will have 10, 10 uh, perspectives. Not that it's not true, that there is no truth, but it is conveyed by human agents. That's all. You know, they're all true, but different aspects of it, right? Some of them are the lying. <laughs> And so on. So that's very important. Agenda setting. That information is selected and then interpreted. And uh, here's, um, which is why, you know, for example, if you have on a political show, always two guys, or well, two guys in the sense of two persons, and one is the Republican, one is the Democrat in the US, right? There is this feeling that there's always two sides. But of course, there aren't only two sides to the issue. Because if you go to France, you will have five people because there are five major parties. You go to Germany again, four or five major parties, you have four or five people with four or five different aspects, right? If it's a political issue, of course, right? So there's not such a thing that there's only this and that. But you see how the, how the choices of interpretation of the media, where you have to have a guy from each camp as if there are two camps. There aren't two, two camps. There, can, there are five, six, seven, eight, nine, a hundred, one million, right? You just don't, this is a simplification. But it, it carries over and then you assume that this is how it shapes your political culture because you assume you have there are two choices. And when we talk about political systems, electoral systems, and ideologies, you'll see how how actually there aren't two. There is no such thing as two choices. <coughs> and um, also, so let's move on. Media obviously crucial. Agenda setting is a cru crucial uh, um, means through which the media acts to shape information. Laws. Laws are a source of political social socialization. Your book doesn't mention it. Again, that's your book. <coughs> so I'm going beyond. Laws. Laws because they tell you what's right and what's wrong. And you grow up within a system of laws and you say, well, obviously there's this and this and this and that. There's individual freedoms are important and civil rights and right to own guns and the criminal, you know, capital punishment and whatever it is. But these are the laws with which, with which with the system of order that has shaped your life. Laws have an edu educative effect, huge educative effect. Because when something becomes legal, we assume that it's also moral. But those are not identical. It was legal for the Nazi regime to kill the Jewish people. It was, actually, according to, the, to the German laws. Well, they were German laws. Well, yeah, it was the law of the country. You know, it, it is legal. Moral and legal is not the same thing, but laws shape shape what we think about the world and then what we think about the political system. Again, you live within a constitution, you assume this is normality. Uh, which is why it's useful to learn about other political systems. And then, finally, we talked about identity, but there's no more... I mean, all the strongest factors on shaping views of the world are major events. Events that maybe traumatize you, 
events that may be shape you, events, events in which you have taken part, let's say you were visiting uh, Cairo a couple of years ago and you happened to be there in early, what was it, 2012, and um, well, you were there the uprising that removed uh, Hosni Mubarak, the Arab Spring. Well, even if you were just a twist, but you're caught up in the event and you see people dying on the streets next to you, you see heroism of young people and then you see brutality, that will shape you. That will shape you. Maybe you grew up uh, in, oppressed in a, whatever society, maybe as a, uh, a black person in uh, South Africa during apartheid, that will shape you. Right? Or just a major 9-11. 9-11 will, you know, will be a determining moment if you were you know, old enough, if you were maybe you were in New York, I mean, that will shape what you think about the world, and that's therefore what you think about politics. So political culture is the sum of opinions, beliefs, and values in a society about politics, or I would rather define it uh, differently. Uh, political culture is basically the sum of expectations about what, uh, and assumptions, so expectations and assumptions about what politics is and what politics should do. Now, Public opinion is sort of a, a snippet of political culture. Public opinion is an insight into what the people think at a certain point. So the public opinion is the attitudes of many people which are collected, aggregated, and summarized or interpreted. So the attitudes of a group of people, of a large group of people, who are collected, put together, aggregated, and then summarized or interpreted. And how do we do this? So public opinion, we do this usually through what? polls. What are polls? Opinion polls or surveys, right? Right. These are tools through which we try to learn about what the public thinks at a certain moment about a certain issue or several, right? So uh, it's basically public opinion polls are questions asked from a certain number of people in order, uh, which <coughs> are meant to represent the, the public's view or position on certain issues at a certain moment. Now here's where, you know, we talk about <laughs> people are reluctant to give credit to opinion polls, right? And indeed, there are many problems. And what can be these problems? Well, since polls are a set of questions, right, that are asked from a number of people that represent the entire popu uh, 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 population, and then these questions are interpreted, all of these aspects can be tricky to manage. First of all, the number of people, this is called a sample. You need to have a certain sample, and I think it's about 3,000 or 2,000, which is kind of the, you know, that's the, for a large population, like the whole country, 2,000 people is uh, a sample. So there are scientific measures to, uh, methods to which <coughs> you can sample about 2,000, and they will be representative of the, of the population at large. Because the number of people sampled is large enough to that all the categories in the population that are relevant, with a certain you know, error you know, uh, uh, limit there, 2-3%, the number of people sampled will reflect all the opinions and categories in the population. Believe it or not, we're more alike than you would think. We're not as unique as you might think. So the sampling is a question. So, for example, if an if a, if a opinion poll is done by a website, or <coughs> you know, and it's voluntary, which means whoever visits my website should ask, uh, should respond to this question. That's not a scientific sample because that's already a sampled part of the population. It's those people who visit your website and they visit it for specific reasons. You already selected your viewers, and guess what? They're going to agree with you, right? So when you have a party who said who on their website say, well. All of you who visit my website, our website should answer these questions. So clearly, though, who visits that party's website? And mostly their supporters and so on. So sampling is an issue. Then the questions, right? How they're phrased, right? Because questions can be leading, they can be neutral, they can give you choices. So if you ask the question, is it, isn't it true that President whichever is fantastic, right? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a question. That is kind of a leading question. But so the question is the, the way to phrase the questions to be not to not be leading but neutral is another thing. Then you have interpretation and how many questions you have, right? Then you have interpretation. What do these questions? How do you interpret these things? And you can be 
of course biased, but you know, serious op opinion posters will not, will try to be, you know, just like any person that wants to do their job well, will try to do this correctly and neutral. But um, in the, the matter of interpretation, it's not necessarily always a, a problem of, <coughs> oh, you want to distort interpretation. No. Really, they have answered this in a specific way. But why they answered in a specific way, that's a different question. You answer that, oh, we don't like President whichever, Obama or Bush or Clinton, who doesn't matter. But why? You can ask certain questions asking them why. But the question is if you, the problem is that it's harder to make the connection from, the, from their answers to the motivations, right? So there's, there's all these issues, but you know, good opinion posters will give you a good snippet of uh, public opinion. Which is what? Which is basically. Opinion, public opinion is a reflection of the political uh, of the of the state of the political culture regarding specific issues at a certain moment. <clears throat> Obviously, in democracy, public opinion is very important because in a democracy, your mandate comes from where the people, at least theoretically. So, both through elections, but also you assume that you represent the people. So, when you have cases like now in the U.S. where Congress has a very low approval, but the president also has a low approval. Then that kind of diminishes your authority, because in democracy you assume that you represent the people. This is why direct election of any institution is a stronger source of power. This is why the, if the president is directly elected, then clearly he will be more than just the ceremonial head of state, because the, it, then he represents the people. He has this popular mandate. So public opinion is crucial because, and this is why it's continuously measured, because it gives you the, the sense of how uh, legitimate the current rulers are, the current government. And since many of these people in, in power will want to be in power after the next election as well, uh, they will try to adjust their position because it depends on public opinion. Good. <coughs> So talk about political uh, socialization and then public opinion takes us to political parties. What are parties? Is it a good word or a bad word? Well, the simplest definition of a party is that it's a group of, it's a group that tries to obtain power. That's about it. That's a party. By obtaining seats in the government. So that's, a party is basically a group of people that try to obtain power. Right? And, or, and so it's an institution, it has common goals, but most goals are towards obtaining power in a political system. That's, that's, the, that's the point of having a party. Why? Well, right, <clears throat> in a democracy we talked about the fact that the idea of representation is key. The idea of representation is the guarantee of democracy, right? Democracy means what? The rule of the people over themselves. But they don't rule over themselves, you don't get to pass laws, I don't get to pass laws, we send representatives to pass laws. Meaning, send representatives to what? Represent our ideas and then battle it out according to certain rules and then pass the rules th that will govern our lives, the laws that will govern our lives. What are political parties in this, in this process? Political parties play a huge role because these are the vehicles through which different opinions in the population are channeled into these institutions of representation. You elect certain people, you elect certain parties, no matter for which institution, because you think they represent you. You choose between different, very, different choices, right? Which say, I stand for this, I stand for this, I stand for this. You choose the one that most fits you for certain reasons. Right? Most fits your goals, your political culture, your beliefs about politics, and so on. Parties are these vehicles that collect all the people who kind of fit a, a, a common mold, and they're the channels through which these, this representation happens. They're crucial. Without parties, there is no democracy. You just have a bunch of people, uh, a chaos. You have a 433 people in the House of Representatives, each doing their own thing. There's no, there's no coherence. You just have a bunch of people. There's no, never, there will never be a law passed when 435 people 
are individual you know, act actors doing whatever they, they want. Parties are vehicles to which ideas, to which the whole principle of representation happens. They're crucial agents for, for, uh, and you're, for uh, democracy. And you're saying, well, yeah, but they want power. Well, what else would they want? Because the whole idea of democracy is that we send representatives to govern ourselves. Power. We want to give them power because they represent us. That's what you want. You want them to get into power. And usually you do want, because it's why you vote for the guy. You want the, your guy to get there. Right? Why? Because you think he represents or she represents you. Yeah, you want them to have power. That's the whole idea of government, right? We want ourselves to rule ourselves, but since we don't have time or don't have the mood to become a politician, to be involved in, in this as a profession, I choose a guy to do this, or a woman, right? That's, that's, so parties are crucial. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the functions of parties, because they perform or, or several aspects of, these, of this, this function. So first of all, what are parties? So these are functions that, or roles that they play. They are a crucial link between the public and the political system. They are, they are your linchpin with the political system. You call your representative, right, when something is wrong. They connect the population with the system. So a link between the public and the political system. Two, they are idea brokers. Which means that they, how do they collect these uh, votes, these opinions, these, these ideas? They present you with a set of, they present you with a set of, of ideas. Right? Let's say you're in, in Germany, Christian Democratic, Social Democratic Party, Free Democrats, uh, the left party and the Greens, five parties. I don't want to give the American example because it's just too, too close to us. Five different parties, right? Five different parties and there are others, but these are the major ones. Which means that each of them comes to you and say, this is how we should live. I have this idea about the economy, this idea about how much money we should give to, to women who have small children, this idea about education, and each of their parties gives you a philosophy of life, right? More or less, more or less. So, they give you a set of ideas and it's easier to subscribe to these things. They collect ideas and they say, well, this is coherent. But well, if you look closely, it's not coherent. No party has a coherent platform. No, not one. Not one. Because it's part of the political uh, game to, well, of the political life to uh, then define a platform that is not like the others. And then you will sometimes sign up to things that has nothing to do with the rest of your platform. Right? That's a different discussion, we're going to get there. But the point is that they are idea brokers. They collect ideas and they present them to you, or you think they present them to you. So actually, you know, they are the agents to which we talk about representation, that different beliefs or opinions or ideas are represented in the legislature. Um, this being like the legislature, right? This is the, the people in the country. Uh, these different ideas are represented here. Well, how do you think they're represented? Because you say, I subscribe to this platform. And here's what we discussed about uh, a few moments ago, that, you know, on TV you see one guy from one party, one from the other on American TV. There's no such thing. If you go on German TV, you'll see five. If you go on French, you'll see 12. And they all come with their own platforms. Because reality is not divided into two or five or 12. But each of them, because they want to coalesce as many votes as possible, right? they will present you with a set of ideas. And you have five sets of ideas, some closer to each other, some farther. And in fact, the, as we'll see in a second, the US parties are actually coalitions of different platforms. Very different ones. But, so idea brokers, they present you with choices that they say are coherent. Mostly they're not. Then they are agents of political socialization, which we just, which we just talked about. They collect ideas and then they what? They teach you about them. So this is, these go together. I mean, all of them go together. They are a link between you and the political system. They collect ideas they should, that they say, well, this is how the world should look and it's all fits together. Why? Um, and then they teach you about it. They tell you, no, no, you have to be a Republican 
because the Democrats are evil, or you have to be a Democrat because Republicans are nasty, or you have to be a Green because both of the big parties are awful here in a two-party system. But most parties, most countries, most political systems are not two parties, are five or ten or whatever. So there you have different, but still you have each party telling you that this makes sense. Only don't be fooled, this is why we learn about different political systems, it's never that it's only the two, two choices. Five, or, or, or four, sorry. Recruiting politicians. If you want to get into politics, you get into politics through parties. Parties are the organized, what are they? They're institutions, remember, the facial institutions, right? From a previous lecture, right? Groups of people that pursue the same goals, following the same rules, with persistence in time, right? Persistence of rules in time, shaping the action of, of a group of people, that's an institution that changes reality. Well, in order to get to power, you need to be part of such an institution, because alone you won't achieve anything. No matter in which position you're put, alone, in any political system, in any reality, in any human reality, you're never going to achieve anything. You always have to work with a bunch of people together, and parties make that real. So, in order to get to politics, vehicles, links, in order to get to politics, this is how you happen. Because parties are institutions that co-opt you and say, yeah, enter into this world. Five, and also related, obviously, is coordination of government. Now, here's, here's our typical view of a political system, right? Let's say, let's, let's, it's perfect, because we can look at both the UK and the US. So, say, this is, the, this is the US. In the US, you have a lower house, an upper house, separately elected, a president, that's the executive. And each of these, these houses are elected separately, and the president separately. Which means that you can have a party which, which has the majority here, and that's X, a party that has the majority here, and that's Y, and the president from party Y. Right? Now, how will you get things done? Because all of these are needed, think lawmaking, to pass a law. All of these institutions have a role in passing the law. President can veto, the, the two houses need both to pass it. How do you do it? Or let's say there aren't parties. If there aren't parties, what in the world will you do? You'll have 435 guys here, 100 persons here, another person here, and each of them are doing their own thing. Nothing gets done. Parties coordinate government. Parties Let's say this party has the majority here, the same party has the majority here, the same party has the presidency. They will, because they're part of the same institution, following the same goals, having the same platform, same set of ideas, they will be able to pass common policy. Because we're all pursuing more or less a coherent set of ideas. It's always more complicated, it's never one well, coherent. But, you know, it's an aggregation. <clears throat> we're all following the same goals. That's what makes government works, work. Right? This is, of course, it's complicated when there's one party here, one party here, and, and so on. So it's divided government that's part of the U.S. political system that you have, you can have that. Right? But in the U.K., you cannot have that. Because in the U.K., there's only one institution that is directly elected, which is what? The Parliament. And as long as you have a majority, which is not always easy to, by the way, keep, and so on, everything else comes from this majority. The executive will be the leader of the majority. Even the judiciary used to be, you know, shaped by them. So winning this, having the majority here, creates coherence in the government because there is a party <coughs> that will also occupy these positions. The same party occupies these, these positions and these positions, so the whole system works. Think of, it, think of it as a political system is a machinery like an engine, and you push the same oil through the entire engine. Right? And let's say that oil can guide the engine, right? We're going into science fiction territory here. But that's, that's what makes the engine work in a specific way. A different, let's say, a different sort of oil will, go, will lead the machinery in a different way, right? Uh, this is the oil that, that, that penetrates every single uh, piece of this machinery 
and makes it coherent. Otherwise, they would be just, if you wouldn't have parties, you would just have different institutions with different individual actors, nothing would get done. Parties unify all these different institutions of government. Even in a system uh, uh, characterized by separation of power or in a system characterized by fusion of power. Because here, you need to populate all these institutions with one party, or to get it done somehow, or, and here you just need to populate one institution and then all the rest of the system. So coordinating government. And six, which is the flip side, is to coordinate opposition. And guess what? That's, that's crucial in a democracy. Because opposition is not just, oh, I'm saying no. But opposition is giving you a different choice. Opposition is, in fact, in the UK, <coughs> in the parliament, there are two, there's a middle row and then there are two sides. This is, hence, the, the names left and right comes, come from there. So on the left, say, on one side you have one party, and usually the members of government, because there's a fusion of power, they also come into the parliament, they sit in the parliament, the members of the executive, they sit... So here's the UK Parliament, this is the middle row, and here are the two major parties. And the members of the executive sit here, and opposed to them, so right, this is the Prime Minister and other ministers. Opposed to them are the opposition party. But not only that, the opposition party has a so-called shadow government. Which is not a government of shadows, but it is a government there possible government if they would be in power. So they have their own false prime minister and their own fake minister of commerce and fake minister of health and fake minister of, not fake, shadow. Why? Because any policy passed by the government is responded to by his shadow, you know, mirror opponent saying, no, 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 here's what I would do. So that's the role. Coordinating opposition is crucial because parties Again, give you a systematic choice. <clears throat> it's not like you have someone party in power and no choice. Because there is, there are other parties, they will give you a coherent, more or less, choice to the party in power. The next lecture then will be talking about different ideas, set these sets of ideas that parties present to you as a platform, and those are political ideologies. That's what we're going to talk about. Today.